Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the best DC Comics podcast, episode five, where we're going to go through a pretty good issue. This is Superman annual number 11 from back in 1985, and a story that I think most people are at least familiar with for the man who has everything. Before we get into that, though, let me tell you, go over to Twitter at Weird Science DC. Follow us. I promise you, we'll follow you back. Also, go to our website, WeirdScienceDCComics.com, where we review almost every issue that comes out each and every week. Go and check that out. And then, if you have the time, go over to our Patreon, Patreon.com slash WeirdScience. Become a Patreon there to support us for everything we do on our regular feeds, not just this DC one, but if you're familiar with our Marvel podcast and our manga one. But if you do go over there, it's not just, hey, throw money at us. I mean, that'd be nice. But the idea that you get a ton of other shows, I think probably the most amount of shows that anybody has on their Patreon. I say that not really knowing it. It's true. I'm just guessing because I don't think anybody else is as, as insane as we are for putting product out there with these product, with these exclusive podcasts. But yeah. Check it out again. It's patreon.com slash weird science. But let's get into this. Let's get into a story that I've never heard anybody bad mouth. I've never heard anybody say anything bad about it is the Superman annual number 11 for the man who has everything. Superman annual number 11 has a cover date of September 1985, published on June 30th, 1985, written by Alan Moore. Art by Dave Gibbons and edited by Julia Schwartz and E. Nelson Bridwell. And I'm going to go into this thinking that most people know the concept of the Black Mercy. When you first read this, and I read it first about 2012 when I first started reading comics. It was one of the first, you know, back issues type of deal that I ended up reading because I'd always heard about it. And the idea that one of the first comics that I read even before that, I mean, I, I end up saying I started reading comics in 2012, but I did read the whole Watchmen deal before, but I didn't read that. And then, oh, my God, these comics, I just read it for Watchmen because I heard about it and then kind of moved on, did my sports and things like that. But in 2012, I ended up getting full into comics, mainly DC comics. And this is one of the first things that I read. And when I did read it, I ended up reading it again right away. And I think that it is one of those issues that once you know the rub of it, you go back and read it to see, oh, my God, I see what was going on there. Because when you first read it, it takes about a quarter of the issue for you to even realize what the heck is going on with these prologues and what seems almost like a flashback and things like that. What it is, is the Black Mercy making Kal-El Superman dream the dream of his deepest heart's desire and to make him content. And we'll get into that as we end up starting with a prologue where a lone figure is walking you know, through a pretty run-down cityscape, an alien-looking deal going, and you have mentions of a red sky, Candor crater. You're getting some hints here until he gets to his apartment, even when he says, I hope that Van and Orna will still be up. Yeah, okay, that must be his kids. Oh, yeah, yeah, I hear them watching Nightwing and Flamebird, another little tell, okay? And when the door opens, it is a surprise party, a surprise party for Cal. They say, happy first day, Cal. There's a bunch of people. You see a little boy, a little girl, and a bunch of other people. That's where Kara Zorel is mentioned. You even see Crypto there. Everybody's there. And it says his weariness lifts. The man has his family about him. He is content. And when we go forward, you realize this contentness is because this is what the Black Mercy does. This is what the Black Mercy wants you to be. If you're content, you won't fight back. And it is feeding off of Cal as this is happening. The only way to get away from the grip of the Black Mercy is to actually fight against your deepest your heart's desire i mean that's a tough thing to do and really shows you how strong will clark is by the end how cal l can fight back with this now we end up on our earth and in the present arctic circle february 29th and you end up having 
Wonder Woman show up with the Invisible Jet to meet Batman and Jason Todd Robin as they're going to go into the Fortress of Solitude and have a little birthday party with Superman. It is his birthday, just as it was in that Dreamscape deal. And I really like Jason Todd here. He's new on the scene, right? He's done some things with Batman, but he hasn't done things in the grander scheme of the DCU. And this is almost, you know, Batman taking him around and then showing him to people. And, hey, now you're you're starting up the ante here. You're going to meet Wonder Woman. Yeah, you met Superman, but you're going to get to go to the Fortress of Solitude. And I like seeing Jason Todd because he's in all of all these things. I mean, he is so wide-eyed in this. Oh, my God. Wonder Woman? Oh, my God. The Fortress of Solitude? At one point, I think that Batman gets upset and is like, you know, you know, calm down. I mean, you've seen the Batcave, right? Yeah, but I'm always in the Batcave. This stuff's cool. I think Batman's getting butt hurt throughout this whole beginning. But they are there to you know wish cal a happy birthday and give a gift to the man who has everything hence the whole deal here the story name and what ends up being the black mercy because they go in and there's like little tells i like when you go back to different continuities and different stories of the past where you get these little tells like oh this is when you know wonder woman didn't fly because she even says man this ice cliff that we have to go up to get into the Fortress of Solitude just gets getting steeper and steeper. Somebody tells Superman, we all can't fly here. And she showed up in the Invisible Jet and things like that. Now, luckily for them, the front door was open. And this is the door with the giant key. If that door wasn't open, they were not getting in. They were going to yui and go home. But they go in, and there's a, a funny little deal where, hey, Wonder Woman, what'd you get, Superman? She's like, I can't say. He'll hear us. It'll spoil the surprise. And she has something wrapped up. and. and Jason Todd here he's not even Anywhere near us oh yeah he's Superman He's got the super hearing Oh I forgot it's cute And then hey Batman would you get Batman doesn't care if anybody hears because He has in my mind Fashioned a deal This gift that he got he's A one upper I'm telling you he ends Up not thinking in his mind What would Superman love What is it that Superman Would really want no no all Batman cares about is What hasn't he got before? Because I want to be a one-upper, and I want to give him something he's never got. And he ends up pretty much yelling at him. I'm telling you, he's just yelling, I got him a new breed and strain of rose called the Krypton. Take that, everybody. Nobody's gotten him that. Nobody would ever think of getting Superman flowers or a plant, especially like an alien plant that'll embed in his chest and give him his deepest desires. Nobody ever think of that, right? They turn the corner. Oh, no. There is Superman with the Black Mercy embedded in his chest. And Jason Todd throws shade and goes, hey, Batman, you got a receipt for that stupid flower? Also, I want to mention that this strain of flower, the strain of rose called the Krypton, really plays out to me like that lame gift of, oh, I named the star after you. Oh, really? Thanks a lot, jerk. But they end up going in Superman. He's just there like a statue. He has this weird alien-looking you know, weed flower type thing in his chest. We know it's the Black Mercy now. And when you talk about great writers, Alan Moore's a great writer, one of the greats. I mean, Hall of Fame. I think that sometimes you forget the idea that great writers, they write great, right? That Obviously, but they also know when not to write. And that's the, that's the, the very special thing. A lot of these writers, especially nowadays, who are considered quote unquote great, They won't shut their mouths, and they never let the art tell the story with them. Well, Alan Moore steps aside for this credits page and lets Dave Gibbons do all of the heavy lifting here, where Superman, he's there looking like a statue staring forward. You add the black mercy in his chest, and then in between his legs on the floor is an opened-up container that has like a wrapping paper, at least you know some cloth or paper around it. That really sets this deal. They are going to Superman to give him his birthday gifts. And there's, oh, my God, this must have been a gift gone awry. Something is going on. And when you first go into it, I don't know that you think, oh, my God, who's the villain that did this? Now, again, you end up saying, I'm not going to say that the cover doesn't spoil Mongol and all that. But let's forget about that, because when Batman, Wonder Woman and Jason Todd come in to figure this out, They really think that this might have just been some alien who sent this to Superman 
not knowing that things would go wrong. Now, Wonder Woman goes right up to him, like feeling, and you have Alan Moore, he has to explain how this thing could burrow through Superman's costume and his chest. And she ends up, and we're going to go with the, you know, the vulnerability to magic, where she's like, I don't know, it feels funny. There's some sort of magic going on here. And they're trying, and Batman says, okay, everybody, you know, we got to get to work. You know, what's going, because Jason Todd goes, Bruce, listen, if something's done this to Superman, and I think he's going to say, like, they might still be here and we're in trouble. Batman says, no, no, no. Then we have to find out what it is quickly as possible without wasting time worrying. We, we can't just sit here and talk and worry. We got to get to work here. And he says, check those wrappings thoroughly and be careful. Let's see what's going on. And Batman is right on the case. And it's it's very quick and minor detective work. But I like it because Batman pulls out the, you know, the bat flashlight. The bat flash. He ends up shining in Superman's eyes and says his eyes aren't moving the light. His pupils aren't dilating in the least. He is cut off from all, almost all sensation. He is in a world all his own, as, you know, you have them. I know that Batman said we can't worry, but they all look worried, especially Wonder Woman and Jason Todd. Well, you go back to the dream world and you go to this Krypton. We, we know then that it's Krypton. He has his wife, Layla, and it's kind of a cool deal where some of the things in here where Alan Morris thought it out enough where, okay, it's cool. You say, hey, this is Superman going back to Krypton that never was destroyed. So he never had to leave as a baby, all this stuff going on. Now, with that, what would he know about Krypton? Who would he know? And basically, the people in this are all either made up or people that he has heard of or know. You know, he ends up having Alora, his aunt, Kara's mother. Kara is in here. You have his father, Jarrell. And you have his wife in this because he's a little older. He is married with kids. And his wife is a lady named Layla. Now, where did she come from? How is he? Is this his dream woman? Is it? No, no. What it is, is he ended up at one point way back in 1960, actually, in November of 1960, Superman number 141. He was able to time travel back to Krypton before it exploded. And he met Layla Laurel, who is pretty much, in my mind, the Marilyn Monroe of Krypton, an actress, a sex symbol. And so since he met her, I guess his mind filling in blanks and things, okay, that's who he's married to in this. Now, it's kind of funny. She is about 20 years older, so he likes them older. Uh, but even then, I think the dream is filling in things and making it work the way it is. And again, they just had this birthday party, and he was content. Well, we see here that there are cracks in this. And I think that what you get by the end is eventually, I mean, eventually at the end, Superman realizes this isn't real, but you're already having problems. And it's funny to think about this as being his heart's desire, his one true dream, where right away there are problems because he ends up saying, why wasn't my dad at the party, Jarrell? And she's like, oh, you know, I called him, but when I invited him and he heard that Alora and Kara were going to be there, he said he was too busy. He bailed. And they're like, you know how he is. He's unreasonable. Jarrell, his brother, he died three years ago, but he still, Jarrell is still upset at things and still will end up fighting politics with Laura and Kara, all these things. So he, he didn't come. Maybe you can go and talk to him tomorrow. Maybe you can go and see him. I think that will make you feel better. But right now, let's knock some boots, baby. And they go up to their room. And the next day he does go and visits his father. He goes in and you get an older like a little bit plumper, Jarrell, you know, he, he's an old guy. He's not exercising as much, but you recognize him right away. And he's like, hey, dad, you know, we missed you last night. And it's kind of a funny deal where you have Alan Moore again being great, where he says, oh, you know, how are the children? How's Layla? How are the children, Van and little Laura? And that's not his daughter's name. Because Jarrell does not see these kids a lot. He doesn't. He, he's in a world of his own. I mean, the idea that this is the, you know, black mercy of Cal L, really the one who's in a dream world is Jarrell, a world of his own. And he ends up saying, no, 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 it's not Laura, Dad. You know that it's, it's Orna. And he's like, oh, it's a shame you didn't name her after your mother, who we find out is dead. 
And it's one of the things that has pretty much made Jarrell into just a negative jerk. I mean, he is a jerk here. He is meeting with two people. He ends up, oh, it's your reverence, Lord M and Major Dax R. They are part of a sect called the Sword of Rao. By the way, even when you meet these guys and then you're told, oh, the Sword of Rao, and it's a sect, you're already like, yeah, these guys are up to no good. And you end up having Cal say, Dad, well, why are you hanging out with these jerks? I mean, these guys are known to be like really awful people. And you have Jarrell in a thing that's very, very topical. To stuff that has gone on, at least in the United States in the past couple of years, where I'm telling you, Jarrell is make Krypton great again. He might as well have the red cap on and says Krypton has gone to hell. You end up having the drugs, the immigrants, and also these kids in their rock and roll. You know, he hates everything of what Krypton has become and wants to get back to the old days. He's also miserable, though, because unfortunately for him, he told everybody in the Science Council as we know for the famed story, with Krypton surviving, well, what does that mean for Jarrell, who started yelling that they were doomed? Krypton's doomed. Oh, my God, it's going to blow up. We're doomed. And then it doesn't happen. He's mad because that's like one time I made a mistake. I know I was loud about it, but still, one time I made a mistake and they kicked me off the science council. Plus, your mom ended up dying from the, the eating. I get that she must have had Kryptonian cancer. She's dead. He is a laughing stock. He's now pretty much become just this guy who screams and yells and goes off the deep end, conspiracy theory. Who knows what he's involved with? But he ends up wanting to do the old Krypton movement. These guys in the Sword of Rao, they're really good. They have a lot of people, and they're going to help me with my old Krypton movement. And you end up having cows like, really, you're still doing that? Like, that's ridiculous. He's like, no, no, no. We got to get Krypton back to what it was. It'll be great. This will be awesome. And yeah, you end up having Cal and really good lines. Says, you know what? I-, I really think in my heart of hearts that you still wish that Krypton exploded. I think that you wish that. Yeah, I mean, that's to show this guy. He's saying that his father wants to be right and wants to be important so much. That the idea that Krypton is doomed, he still wishes it did happen. He wished that everybody was dead and Krypton was destroyed because that's what he said. And you end up, you see, Jarell is mad and upset and, you know, all this stuff. Well, we go back to our regular deal in the Fortress of Solitude where, like I said, you have the three of them, Batman, Wonder Woman, and Jason Todd, trying to figure out, like, what's going on with this, this plant? And they come up with the idea that maybe because it's Superman's birthday, this looks like a gift. Maybe Superman, and I love this idea, maybe Superman loves birthday gifts so much that he ended up making a teleporter for different alien planets, but only use it the one day. They even say he probably only uses it on his birthday, right? Because he's that kind of guy. And they end up sending him gifts. He gets them. He opens it up. Oh, my God. Where's this from? Oh, my God. This is neat. A little tchotchke. Oh, my God, a little nesting doll from the planet Gleep Gloop, right? Those sort of things. And maybe somebody sent this flower, this this plant, not knowing what it would do on Earth, not knowing what it would do to Superman. So they're trying to figure it out. Maybe it's not as nefarious as maybe it looks. All of a sudden, Mongol shows up. And Mongol, for how big this guy is, boy, he sneaks up on him. And he's like, ah, you know what? You're kind of right. He does have a teleporter. People do send him gifts like what I sent. I sent him this flower, the Black Mercy. He ends up naming it. But, you know, you're actually smarter than I think you are. You're still stupid. You guys here on Earth, you're still nonsense. But I'll give you credit. You kind of came up with it. But there's two minor details you're wrong with. Number one, I knew what this plant would do to him. I knew 100%. And it was not sent as a token of gratitude. This was not a birthday present that I sent because I'm nice and love Superman. No, I knew that it was going to do this. And let me tell you what it would do. And I mean, Mongol is huge to them. I will tell you as we go forward with this. And one of, and I'm telling you, the biggest shade throwing thing ever done to Batman and very subtle, but they don't know who Mongol is. This is not a Mongol. Oh man, it's Mongol. Oh, Jace, Mongol's back. They have no idea. They're like, who is this? Wonder Woman doesn't know. Batman doesn't know. 
And they're trying to figure out this Mongol says, listen, this thing is called the Black Mercy. I traveled great way into the tangled zones to locate it. I'm expecting Batman to say, I had a rose made, though. He still wants to one up everyone. But Mongol says what this does. It is something between a plant and an intelligent fungus. It attaches itself to its victims in the form of a symbiosis feeding from their bio aura. So it is feeding off of Superman as this is going on. What does it give the host in return? Why it gives them their heart's desire. And he explains that it's telepathic. It reads them like a book and feeds them a logical simulation of the happy ending they deserve. Of course, its victims could shrug it off. This is something where you could say, no, 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 this isn't right. This is wrong. But but who wants to? It says that the host, the victim, doesn't want to. Everybody wants to live out their happy ending, their heart's desire. And that's what you know Superman is going through at the moment. Though, as Mongo is talking trash here, we did see that this isn't exactly the nicest thing. I mean, can you sit there and think in your mind, okay, Superman's heart's desire is to have his father, Jarell just be a sad sack. I'm not going to go with the idea that he kind of was seen to be a you know a bad guy in Bendis's nonsense. I'm going, but does that seem like it already feels like Superman's trying to push back, trying to convince himself to make this, you know, something that he doesn't like to go out? But we'll get to that as the trip. I'm telling you, the shade goes here because he even keeps going. Okay, you know, I delivered it through this teleportation channel. You're right. I waited a bit. Okay, he's going to open it around now, probably counting one Mississippi, two Mississippi, probably like one War World, two War World, three Mongol, five War Zone. He ends up counting this and realizes, okay, by now it's taken effect, and then uses the teleportation channel to come to the fortress himself. So he ends up there, and yeah, unfortunately for everyone, Superman is out of commission with the Black Mercy. Now, this is where the, the shade, and I love this Mongol, I love the line here because Batman says, what are you? Who the hell are you? And Mongol, th- here's the thing to set this up. I am a father of five. I, you know, they were little kids at one point. And, you know, you end up realizing some people who aren't good with kids. Some people are. But even ones that, you know, oh, you never had kids, whatever. Because a lot of times when somebody goes to talk to a little kid. They just stand there and they talk and you're looking down at the kid. The kid now is going to be anxious about it. It's going to feel defensive, all that. But when you know somebody who's good with kids, and this is just a tip. If you're ever talking to kids, please do this. You squat down to their level. Get eye to eye with them and talk to them as an equal. That does wonders to talking. Mongol does it to Batman. Mongol, he treats Batman like a little kid and squats down. And says the biggest trash talk line ever, where Batman says, again, what are you? And he says, if you don't already know my name, then you're not worthy of an introduction. Why would I tell you who I am? I mean, if you don't know, then I, you're nothing to me. Get out of here. Uh, you, you are a speck. Get out and says, I'm the new manager around here. I'm going to have to settle in. I'll learn your customs. And pretty much... Which one of you? I don't know the customs of who I'm supposed to kill first. So can you tell me? I mean, let me know which one of you. It, it Pretty much this is Mongol. First day in prison out in the yard. Okay, which one's the biggest? I'm gonna, I have to take down the biggest guy so you know I mean business. Wonder Woman steps up and she's like, okay, here it is. And, and as this again, Mongol is so bad ass in this because he has these gloves, these gauntlets. Now, we figure it out. Batman. And Jason Todd even figured out that he has those gloves because of when he was handling the Black Mercy. You you can't touch it or it's going to attach to you. But he wants to fight now. He's a bare-knuckle brawler. He ends up taking down the gauntlets. He puts them down. He's like, all right, let's go. Wonder Woman comes and just wallops him, an uppercut to the chin. She has to jump to do this. And you end up where it does nothing. It actually intrigues Mongol. He goes, huh. Wonder Woman is grabbing her hand as if she had broken her hand on Mongol's jaw. I mean, it is pretty bad. Mongol then, and you get to see the scope of, you know, the size difference, where he ends up then picking Wonder Woman up by the head, and his hand 
this is where, again, this might be obscure to some. Me and my son, when my son Rafe was younger, he was really into professional wrestling. And we went to a WWE match. And the great Kali was at this match. And, and we were pretty close, like right there, we were on the aisle. And when the wrestlers would come down, Rafe would yell out to him and he yelled out to the great Kali. And the great Kali came and he like went to pat Rafe on the head. But what he did was grip Rafe's head. And I swear to God, I, I figured the great Kali is not going to do anything bad. I mean, but the, the anxiety, it was like almost sheer terror. When I saw that this guy had his hand around Rafe's head like he could crush it like a grape. And it was quick, but I was like, I might not have been more scared than ever. And that's how Mongol is to Wonder Woman. Well, we continue then into the dreamscape of the, you know, Black Mercy of the mind of Cal. And he ends up getting called. And I like this, too, because what Alan Moore is doing you're not having great transitions from the scene to scene in the dream, but it's like a dream then. That's how dreams work. You kind of jump around, you kind of do that. And this is all of a sudden Cal and his young son. They come flying in. Oh, my God, what's going on? They come into a hospital where Alora is, his aunt and Kara's mother. Oh, my God, what happened? What happened? Alora's crying. She ends up having her mascara running. Oh, my God, I can't believe this happened. I can't believe. Oh, my God. And Van, the the son, he's confused. What's going on, Daddy? What's going on? Why is Anna Laura upset? What happened to Kara? What's all this? And you end up having the idea where Kara was attacked. Kara was attacked by a group of protesters, another group that is against the elves and is against Jarrell and is against the Phantom Zone. Pretty much these are a bunch of people who say, that the Phantom Zone, and we get this lately even. We had it, you know, a bunch of times recently. The idea that the Phantom Zone is torture. The Phantom Zone is not ethical. And it's like down with the Phantom Zone, down with Jarrell. He's the worst and all that. Well, when Kara ends up going to some neighborhood that is a little down on the L's, a little down on, uh, you know, all that, she ended up getting attacked and put in the hospital. I mean, she's worse for wear. She is just out and uh you know you have cal go in to talk and like well she's not really going to be able to talk much very quick but it is that oh my god what happened the doctor says well she went and figured out that some neighborhoods aren't really down with the elves they recognized her with the connection and they ended up attacking her and then you end up cal coming out and in the meantime you do end up having uh van who was playing you know nightwing and flame bird little action figures with the nurse they're playing around and stuff like that is it's cute it really doesn't mean much it's just another mention of nightbird or uh nightwing and flame bird which again with alan Moore grabbing things or whatever those were kind of made by jimmy olsen and cal when they went in the bottled city so that's kind of a, a cool little tie-in to what little van would like to play with but you end up having cal call Clara and say, listen, go to your parents, go to your parents in Atomic Town. You know, we got to get out of here. We, we're in big trouble. Uh, we're not safe. The House of L is under attack. If we're seen and they may come to our apartment, if they find out where we live, they're going to come and kill us. So, you know, go to your parents in Atomic Town. You and, uh, you know, the daughter, you go off and me and Van will meet you. We'll get in the car and we'll meet you there. But let's go there. So they go out and you, you get the idea again that Van it's so funny he's like yeah we're gonna go on a little trip and superman is trying he's doing that thing where you don't tell your little son the real truth you're like oh we're going on a little fun trip we're gonna go to your grandparents oh we're gonna go this he's like not jarell right no 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 not jarell your mom's fan oh thank god and so they're gonna go they run right into a old krypton rally and when you ended up having Jarrell talking to those guys from the sort of row when Cal was there, they did mention, hey, are you going to be talking at the, the big rally? And yeah, while they're there, Cal and Van, who Van saw, I hate Grandpa Jarrell. All of a sudden, Jarrell is right in front, down with these people and up with old Krypton as you have. You know, Cal, and they're desperately trying to get the hell out of there, and they're stopped by this big protest. You even have some of these Phantom Zone protesters there, there, everything's gone to hell here. Well, we go back to the fortress, and 
Wonder Woman is fighting Mongol. Mongol just throws her through a wall. Just boom. I mean, they're in trouble and they need Superman. At one point, Batman says, we have to get Superman out. He's the only one who's going to be able to stop this guy. But luckily, Wonder Woman gets thrown into like the, you know, the armory. It is where, you know, all the guns are kept in the Fortress of Solitude. And she ends up picking up the plasma disruptor that I say the name because Mongol recognizes, ooh, you grabbed the plasma disruptor. Why don't you get something smaller that your female hands, he's really sexist, your female hands can handle a smaller weapon. She does end up blasting Mongol. It does nothing. It even seems to power him up. It hits his cube deal. Everything's gone wrong. Mongol just grabs Wonder Woman and slams her face right into the wall. And she gets knocked out. She is going to get killed. And now you're going frantically between the fortress deal and of the mind black mercy where Jarrell is now these people, you know, we got to stop this. We got to bring back the real Krypton. It should have exploded. This is not like he's just going on as the counter protest. You're the worst Jarrell. You're a jerk. You made the Phantom Zone. You, you jerk. And so Cal is dead. Like we got to get out of here. Things are going bad. So they end up kind of taking a Yui, and they drive off, and, and Cal is upset. Dan says, Dad, well, where are we going? We just passed the, you know, the gold volcano. This isn't where Grandfather Allura Roll lives. We're, why are we going here? And he's like, listen, I, your dad has to collect his thoughts. I'm having some problems here. Things are bad. And this is where, again, like I said, Cal, in his mind, is either making this bad stuff happen so that he can break out of this, because this isn't his heart's desire, or because of that, he's recognizing it as it not being that. Maybe a little column A, column B, where they end up going to the Candor Crater where he works, and he has Van come out, and, and, and little Van's so sweet and innocent, maybe a little dumb. We're not going to get shrunk, are we? Like, no, Ken, like, no, Van, that, that happened a while ago. And he's like, listen, come here. Let your dad hug you one last time. And he's crying. Superman's crying. And he's, and he's like, well, what's going on, Dad? Can't we go see Mom? Can't we see Orna? I'm getting cold. And Cal's like, Van, I have a feeling, oh, dear, Ral, uh, am I going mad? I keep thinking that, Van, please know this isn't going to make sense to you, but as everything is disappearing and it, it almost plays off like a sandstorm as it's going but even ben himself everything is now disappearing because he says i don't think you're real and in the fortress the black mercy's tentacles roots are loosening on superman as he in the real he's crying I'm like oh my god he's crying you know water's coming out of his he's got the his eyes are raining but they are able to pull off the Black Mercy. Now, with that, you end up having Jason Todd bring over the gauntlets, the huge Mongol gauntlets. Batman's trying to pull it off. You end up going back to the mine for one last time, where a father has to say goodbye to a son. And it, you can sit there and say, well, it's not real. It's a, no, no, no. It's like the guy who was yelling about the wrestling. It's real to him. It's real to get. He is watching his son. Who even says, I know, I was there when you were born. I have all these memories. I, I don't think you're real and you're, you're just going to disappear. And he does. I mean, this is awful. But in the evil deal, we'll find out that legitimately, when you think of this story, you think about the idea that Mongol, oh, what did Mongol do? Well, he wanted to subdue Superman so that he can go and do his thing and try to take it. That's not exactly what happens. When you end up having Superman break out of this and go, I mean, pissed, and he goes and attacks Mongol, Mongol kind of points out the idea that I knew that eventually you'd break out of it. But what I also knew then, to break out of it, your heart will be broken. You will never forget this. This is something where you have now watched your entire family, who you have full-out memories, they were real to you at a point, you see that the end you have watched them disappear and die. And it's so evil what Mongol's doing because then he's like, now I'm going to kill you. But even before that, where Jason Todd brings over, hey, I got these gloves. Why don't you use it? Batman's like, no, 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 we don't have time. I got to grab this out of Superman because Mongol is pretty much going to kill Wonder Woman. We got to stop this. When Batman pulls out the Black Mercy, it attaches itself to Batman now. 
And all of a sudden, and very quick, you go into this deal. And I love this concept. It's not just the idea that Batman wishes his parents never got killed. There's more to that as a little boy, I think, where the Black Mercy's there. And he's going through, oh, there's a family going in Crime Alley. Oh, my God, there's that weasel face guy. He has a gun. He fires. I really think that what Bruce, as that little kid, and his heart's desire, isn't just that you know, they don't die, but it's that his dad is able to subdue Joe Chill and rip the gun out. That there's a, oh my God, my dad's my hero. Look at him. He not only, because Joe Chill fires and misses and then says he misses and Thomas Wayne takes the gun away from him with no trouble at all because that's his hero. So in that dream, it's like, oh my God, my hero did it. He ended up missed, and then he grabbed and he grabbed the gun out of the guy because, and he didn't even, it was nothing to him because he's such a great, powerful man. And I think that that little bit, that little extra really made me like, that's really good. That's really good. It's not just, hey, what's that desire? Oh, his parents live. All right. You would figure that, but I like that little bit. Now, with that, you have Jason Todd is just like, what am I going to do? Oh, my God, Bruce, wake up as... Superman is kind of coming to, you know, get his wits together, go all this, and you end up having Jason Todd, please, please wake up. I don't know if the human body can stand it. So, yeah, Superman was able to withstand this Black Mercy, but could a regular human like Batman do it? He doesn't know, and he's worried. He's very worried. And he says, if it didn't do any harm to Superman, and Superman is standing behind Jason Todd, and he is flexing and says, Who did this to me? And you end up having Jason who, again, this is a little kid pretty much. And he's like, um, I I don't know. Is this big yellow guy? He's through there hurting Wonder Woman. I I don't know. Uh, Are you okay? You look kind of meh. And you end up having Superman just kind of say plain Mongol. And then realizes it and yells Mongol so loud that it knocks Jason Todd over as he's holding on to his ears. I mean, his ears are probably ringing for weeks now because Superman is so mad. Again, it's not just the idea that Mongol is hurting Wonder Woman. It's not just the idea, oh, he tricked me. And get he made Superman, you know, have a family in a Krypton that did not blow up and then took it from him in a way like that. And Mongol thinks it's hilarious. And the, the art of Superman just taking off, taking off so quickly to go fly at Mongol that it leaves a crater behind in the floor when he goes off. And you end up having Jason Todd, Superman, wait, he's not waiting. Wonder Woman's about to get killed. And when he, Superman yells out Mongol, you see Mongol realizes and says, you know, he hears a voice like Armageddon shouting his name and he starts to turn. He knows he has perhaps less than half a second in which to defend himself. And yeah, Superman busts through the wall and just levels Mongol. But to show that Mongol's pretty kicking, it does not stop him. Mongol ends up punching Superman and the fight is on. Now, with all of that, there's kind of a wonky thing because you end up having Jason Todd put, I mean, huge gloves. It's pretty funny. He puts on these Mongol gauntlets and then rips the Black Mercy out of the chest of Batman. Now, they kind of even said with Superman, we can't do that. It might cause problems, and it should, but it doesn't. At at the end, Batman has some bandages on, so it did end up burrowing in, but he seemingly is able to, you know, bounce back from that. But what is Jason Todd going to do? He he has the Black Mercy now in his hands. He's got the gauntlet, so it's not going after him. And you see Jason Todd uses some smarts because he runs off to try to find Superman. And Mongol, but he runs off as you just have Mongol and Superman just busting through every floor, roof, wall of the Fortress of Solitude, just going. And it does look like at a point Mongol is going to kill Superman. Superman uses his heat vision, knocks Mongol back. They're going back and forth where you then have Jason Todd run. He still has this awful, you know, octopus looking Black Mercy in his gauntlet hands. And he gets to a point where things have been wrecked. And there's no way to get up to this other level. There's a platform, but he can't get up to that while holding the Black Mercy. So he actually thinks on his feet. He takes one of the gauntlets off, puts the Black Mercy into that, and then wraps it up in a bag so that he can carry it. 
and then ends up repelling with, you know, a zip line deal, goes, gets it on a thing of rebar that's coming out and is able to climb then up to this next level to get to Superman and Mongol, who they're still fighting. They kind of fall down another level, but he's able to get to them. He ends up taking the Black Mercy out, has the gauntlets back on. And again, you end up having both Mongol and and Superman yelling at each other. And Superman ends up saying, and it's really cool, where Mongol says, you should have stayed in whatever happy fantasy the Black Mercy granted you. And Superman stops and is like, happy? Happy? And then just goes and starts fighting again. And ends up saying pretty much, you you made me watch people I love die. That is not happy, but that is what Mongol wanted him to do. That's what he wanted out of this. Now, they're fighting, they're fighting, they're fighting, they're going through floors, all this stuff going on. And it's pretty even. I mean, at points, you're like, oh my god, Superman's going to defeat Mongol. Oh my god, Mongol fought back and is going to defeat Superman. You get to the foyer of where you have the statues of Jarrell and Laura holding Krypton above, you know, the famous statue. And you have Superman who's just punching the crap out of Mongol and then looks up and sees that and goes, oh, no, Krypton. And that gives Mongol the opportunity. Mongol hits Superman. This is it. He is going to kill Superman. He really is going to kill him. Superman was distracted. Krypton, (laughs) it's so weird. but. You know, this is going to end it. This is going to end Superman. He's going to die on his birthday. I mean, seriously. And from off panel, you get this, uh, uh, excuse me. And you look up and through a hole in the roof, there is Jason Todd with the gauntlets on. And he's holding the Black Mercy. And he says, I think this is yours. And now throw shit. Because when Mongol first showed up, he said, you, you know, primates are almost intelligent. And this stuck with Jason Todd. Jason Todd's like, oh, yeah, hey, I think this is yours. Almost intelligent, huh? And throws the Black Mercy down on Mongol. It goes on his chest. Superman's able to break free. Now, this is where you get a really cool ending because you also, you, the Black Mercy's on Mongol, so he's going to think of his, you know, heart's desire. So when you see. On the right hand, what's really happening, you see on the left side of the paneling what Mongol thinks is happening in his Black Mercy dream. In his Black Mercy dream, he swipes the Black Mercy away. It never embeds in his chest. He shoots and disintegrates Robin, rips off Cal's head. Superman's head is just torn off, puts it on a pike, and then goes and uses that as he takes over the universe. Now we see what's really happening is The Black Mercy's on his chest. He falls over and starts smiling. And it looks like Superman must pick him up and lean him against the wall, almost like Han Solo and Carbonite. Here you go. Lean there and let's have fun now. (laughs) It's birthday time where Mongo is just there leaning against the wall, smiling, where Jason Todd goes, I wonder what he's thinking of. Uh, But they're talking about, oh, my God, how do you feel, Batman? Oh, I feel okay, but in my dream... I was married to Kathy Kane. I had a teenage daughter. It was crazy stuff, right? And they're all laughing about it and whatnot. Um, And then Wonder Woman, who didn't have the Black Mercy on her, I mean, she thinks this must be the greatest thing. I mean, we know it isn't, but I'm a little envious. It must be wonderful to find out just what your heart's desire really is. That's where Jason's like, look at Mongol against the wall. He looks pretty happy. He's having a good time. I wonder what he's thinking of. We find out. I mean, what what else would Mongol think of but taking over the entire galaxy, all of existence with a re-resurrected war world, you know, shooting things that look like he is blowing up Alderaan like 17 times. He is happy. But while that's going on, you end up, okay, it is the birthday. Hey, what did Wonder Woman get back? Uh, Superman. What did? And she got him. A exact duplicate of the bottled city of Candor. In this, recently, you ended up having Superman and Carol with them. They ended up able to enlarge the bottled city. In the meantime, it kind of collapsed and, you know, a lot of things went wrong, but they were rebuilding. But when you have this, Wonder Woman thinks, well, Superman, Cal, you must, you know, you like looking at the bottled city, and somehow she thinks that he needs a model of it because, you know, he was used to it and he misses it. 
the fact of the deal, he had already built himself a model that he has where the bottled city usually was. I like that Wonder Woman gives him this bottle that does look like something that you'd make wine in with a, you know, a stopper, a cork stopper. But you end up, Superman isn't one to say, oh, I already have one. So he ends up using super speed flies, grabs the model he had already made of Kandor and hides it in a, in a freaking, uh, like a uh, filing cabinet type deal. Boom, puts that, comes out. Hey, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Diana. That is real nice of you. Batman's like, hey, I got you. Oh, no. I got you this rose, but it was trampled on. <laughs> and, and I love the idea where you end up, well, that's probably for the best. I'm like, really? Oh, Batman, you didn't win in the end. But yeah, Mongo's just sitting there. He's smiling like, I wonder what he's thinking of. Eh, well, we'll figure it out. They're going to get coffee. Also, the question of, hey, what are you going to do with Mongol? He's just leaning against the wall. He has the Black Mercy. Superman <laughs> Superman says, hey, do you know about that black hole as you come in via the western spiral arm of the galaxy? He says this to Jason. Jason's like, oh, no, I, I don't think I know about that. And Superman kind of says, eh, I'm going to throw him in the black hole. We never find out if he did, and then you end up having – the crisis, everything gets reset anyway. But, you know, you can think that he went and threw him in the giant black hole just to, you know, make sure that nothing crazy happens while he still has the black mercy. And yeah, and you end up having the deal where there's the epilogue and we find that Mongol is sitting on a throne. Everybody's worshiping him. He's going through the galaxy in that resurrected war world and he's destroying everything. And the big thing, like the first panel, this is the bookend. This is how you do it, folks, is the idea that the nebula echo with the screams of the dying, he is content. And it shows Mongol, just as it said, on Krypton with Cal el for his first day party, his family's around him. And you get to see what makes the characters tick. Superman's all about love and family. And Mongol's all about the Death Star and destruction. And he's happy and he's there. He got what he wanted. Uh, so all of that, and, and with that, you see he's not as strong-willed as Superman, who was able to kind of realize that this wasn't the, the way that things should be and breaks out of it, where Mongol could be just, I mean, he's just going to imagine. I mean, the only thing that I could think would end up, it would be like a Caesar deal that after so much time with the Black Mercy, Mongol's going to weep because there was nothing left to conquer. But that's a while now, plus he might be in a black hole, and there's a crisis, so... All of that said and done, it ends. You have a Dave Gibbons pullout thing. You have a lot of things going on in this, and it's awesome. It's really good. I hope that I did it some justice. I got excited at the point, and it really does get fast-paced, so it really plays out that way. But it is one of the best stories from DC Comics, so it fits in this podcast full out 100%. I hope you enjoyed this. Again, go off to Twitter at, what is it, Weird Science DC. And then go to our website, weirdsciencedccomics.com, for reviews of most of the books that come out each and every week. And then go to our Patreon to help support us for the stuff on this feed, this podcast, The Secret Origins, one, our weekly review show. And then go and get more and more shows. Each level on the Patreon, you get more and more shows and a lot like this. Like I said, if this is kind of your thing and you like to hear people talk about comics you know this is the place to be so check that out all the links will be in the show notes i hope you enjoyed this and with that i will tell you that i will talk to you later 